بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ڈیئر اسٹوڈنٹس آور کرنٹ سیشن فوکسز آن لینگویج پالیسی اینڈ پلاننگ آئی ہوپ اینڈ ایکسپیکٹ بائی دا اینڈ آف دس سیشن یو وڈ بی ایبل ٹو انڈرسٹینڈ واٹ از لینگویج پالیسی اینڈ پلاننگ اینڈ ہاؤ ڈز اٹ ریلیٹ ٹو لینگویسٹکس اینڈ پرٹیکولرلی ٹو سوشل لینگویسٹکس Well, my dear students, at the very outset, let us start with the concept of language that is one of the key elements of construction of the self of human beings in the social context. All children are socialized into their respective language groups and in fact, before they enter into schooling, they learn how to socialize through language. It is their adults who teach them how to use not only the structures of language, but also how to use them with social competence and thus achieve their functions in the social life. Thus, the processes of policing, protecting and promoting language to a certain degree start even before children start going to school. These are actually all the forms of language policy. However, when it comes to the processes of, you know, living in a society, there are certain other factors, for example, the school, the state, etc., that settle the policies and thus, you know, give a certain form and shape of the language of a particular society. I would also like to introduce the term LPLP. that is language planning and language policy. Um, this LPLP abbreviation would be uh, found frequently in the literature on linguistics and social linguistics. In fact, all societies do the processes of language planning and policy. One of the key elements that leads towards or that serves as a motivation to do uh, language planning and to, to make policies for language is The, the factor of nationalism. Well, culturally and linguistically, homogeneous people, they, they come together as a society or as a group and as a state, and this is, uh, you know, language through which they differentiate themselves from other groups of people. Thus, nationalism is one type of political setting in which LPLP is used, you know, as a tool to not only give them a particular kind of identity, but also to safeguard this identity in relation to the other identities, you know, that survive, um, that have a kind of a coexistence around. The role of LPLP in the, in the processes of national, uh, you know, um, in, in growth and development and nation building is very, very significant. In fact, if we go back to 1970s, this was the time when intense, you know, efforts were consciously made for um, LPLP activities around the globe. And the governing classes of newly independent states, they considered how it was very important for them to um, build certain language policies and then to process those policies through the society to give, you know, a kind of... Um, Mm, uh, not only to, to safeguard the independence of the state, but also to give it a kind of, uh, you know, differentiation from other states around. This led to the classic division of LPLP into status planning, corpus planning, and acquisition planning according to Cooper 1989. So, you know, within these subdivisions of language planning and policy, then different experts and different, you know, linguists and researchers worked. When it comes to status planning, it was, you know, focusing on the highest levels of polity. Um, actually, this... Um, status planning was concerned with enshrining the policy in law, which means, you know, um, kind of protecting, safeguarding, and covering the aspects of policy with the help of law. This is the case when a language is formally adopted as a national language for a, for a country or for a state as well. So, you know, this is a process of legalizing that language as a national language or as a standard language, um, which thus, you know, supports legally, you know, to carry out certain national activities or formal activities of the, of the people of that society in that particular language. 
As far as corpus uh, planning is concerned, it is an attempt to change the forms and structures of the language itself. Corpus, as I assume and hope that you know, uh, means a huge collection. So, you know, corpus planning is the planning of the collection of the items of language. So, you know, it is, you know, kind of depending upon the national needs, depending upon the societal needs, adding to the vocabulary of the language, revising, revisiting the structures of the language, and thus making certain policies that support that. This task is often taken by national language planning agencies in every state. It also involves the processes of codification of language and standardization of language. So, you know, a standard variety of that language is made that is differentiated from the non-standard varieties, and that standard variety is used for all the formal and official processes. As far as acquisition planning is concerned, it is um, with reference to the implementation of um, all that corpus that is designed and all that planning that is done with reference to the policy. So that people could learn that standardized language, people could learn that national language, the language that is given the status of a national language. Most of the times it is educationists who are, you know, brought into that. Education specialists, they would design plans and projects how to uh, make the children of that particular state or nation to learn that particular language. LPLP has a great significance in nation states. The, the state nations, um, you know, first appeared as France, Spain, Britain, Sweden, and the Netherlands um, that emerged from feudalism. The ruling dynasties overcame the challenge to their power from their uh, aristocracies and secured stable state boundaries. And actually, this was the point where language came in to give a certain form and a shape to a particular state nation. And the processes of language uh, planning and policy were started consciously and vigorously. The era of strong central government that followed, in fact, in these areas, it ensured that the dialect of the capital and court would take precedence over all other dialects and the languages in the state. So, you know, because there would be different dialects, so the dialect that would be related to the court and that would be, that is the, the ruling class and the, you know, uh, that would be related to the, the law and the capital, you know, that dialect would be promoted then in such a way that the other varieties surrounding it would just remain dialects and this would be given the form and shape of a standardized language and often would be called a national language. So, you know, this would be used by the civil service for the administration of the country, um, and thus this would become a political tool as well. If I give you the examples, the Act of Union of 1536 in Britain decreed that only those Welsh who had learned English uh, could hold public offices. So, you know, this is one of the examples of the significance of, you know, uh, the national language and, you know, its implementation through policy. The Academia della Crusa in Florence and the Academia Francaise in Paris are two very early instances of the institutions um, who worked on the development of the linguistic corpus um, and planning of the, the corpus um, in the relevant areas. Where actually there were no uh, official corpus planning institutes, for example, in Britain, um, in those areas, individual scholars took up the, the case and they worked on that. And it was the, it, they were, there were linguists, there were researchers, and there were scholars who contributed towards that. For example, Samuel Johnson is famous for his uh, dictionaries uh, in this regard. Well, when it comes to LPLP in nation states, the philosophy of nationalism spread across Europe, and by the mid-19th century, most of the continent had been touched by the ideology of nation state, where, you know, uh, based on the differentiations of the languages of people, you know, different states were made. Various movements for, self, uh, for national self-determination appeared during this time, thus language planning and policy gathered significance. In fact, it was all over the continent and from the Greeks in the southeast to the Irish in the northwest, language was central to the case of independence.
In fact, to be a nation, a group felt it had to be both cohesive and has to be distinct from or distinctive from others. As a group, combined, united together, and as a group, being different, distinctive from other groups in the surroundings. And language was one of the major tools that were used for that. Um, single language, single nation was the idea. Independence movements use their linguists to develop distinct language needed for the nation's claims to sovereignty, according to Smith, 1991. Globalization also had a strong impact on uh, LPLP and moving into post, uh, you know, uh, national times where, you know, now the boundaries of nations are blurring, you know, language policy and planning now is taking new forms and shapes. In fact, from... Uh, you know, World War II onwards, when we look at the uh, situation, most of the state nation sovereignty was relinquished and there was a shift to the institutions and authorities of corporations and organizations that would work on um, uh, transnational or supranational levels. So, you know, um, emergence of lingua francas like English um, during the times and, you know, certain policies and plannings to, you know, promote um, such language, um, you know, corpuses or some such language, you know, plans um, that would help the um, international communication. We can notice their emergence through the times. In fact, um, LPLP scholars are divided on the issue of globalization. There are two perspectives. One perspective is that of Crystal 2003, and Van Pages 2004, um, and many scholars, of course, um, who joined them in this, that is to see, you know, um, uh, you know, language as a common good, to, to develop, to establish one language as a common good for all the nations. Whereas there were other scholars who opposed, and they saw the spread of English as another kind of imperialism.